Are you an HR department of one trying to figure out how to balance task and strategy while keeping up with changes in regulatory compliance? Do you need a fresh outlook on old topics? Then stop what you're doing, grab your coffee, and get ready to recharge. If you have people, you have problems to solve and things to do. Your host is Brenda Neckvottel, a 20-year human resource professional, ready to explore the HR industry with veterans of business and life with fresh eyes and new ideas. Learn about the rapidly evolving changes in employment law around the country, as well as new tactics to deploy and build engagement in your work workforce. If you're looking to implement new practices to make your job easier in HR, then this podcast is for you. Hey everyone and welcome back to the show. I'm Brenda and I am super excited that you guys are here today. Um, It's been a heck of a week. Holy cow, it has been a, a tickling the 100 degree mark over here in Virginia and having to talk to quite a few people about safety, 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 but that's actually not what we're going to be talking about today. Um, Today I am actually working in a different studio, so um, we won't have to worry about good old Lola and Champ uh, piping in at any point in time, which they're pretty good at doing, Um, but that's okay. And if you, you know what, if you guys are joining me for the very first time, thank you so much for showing up. It's really great to have you. You're going to get a lot of, of information out of this podcast and out of the series. Um, my goal is to constantly bring very different and unique topics um, to, to bring that actually matter to businesses and folks that are listening. So thanks for joining us. If you've been paying attention, if you've been uh, joining on the show week after week after week, holy cow, thank you so much. You guys are absolutely fantastic. Um, you're bringing great energy, great attention, great questions to the table. And uh, it's allowing these awesome conversations to start happening. So let's get into it. So today we're going to be talking about quite a few employment law changes that are coming across the nation. And a couple of uh, episodes ago, I mentioned that we are now kind of in that mid-year part where legislation is coming out, all of these new things that are taking place, laws, you know, their start dates are in effect and and we're starting to see a lot of interesting mobility. So we're going to be talking about some of those things. Today we're going to be talking about, we're going to have you sit down and really ask yourself the question is, how recession proof is your company and your staff? So how repressive, I can't can't say it, holy cow, how recession proof are you and your staff? Now part of the reason why I brought this topic to the forefront is that economists have been predicting the next recession. It can happen anywhere between, according to them, 2018 and 2020. So um, we're going to get into that a little bit more. I've got some announcements down towards the back end, and I'm going to help you guys figure out how you can go ahead and follow me because there's all sorts of really cool stuff that's coming down the pike. I am super, super excited and have been literally cranking out the workload. So uh, it's going to be good and I'm really looking forward to it. So the information uh, that is available through this podcast is really for informational purposes only and not for the purpose of providing legal advice. I'm not an attorney, unfortunately. Um, It sounds like it would be a really fun job, but I'm not. And if you, you know, you really should contact your attorney to obtain legal advice with respect to any particular type of issue HR related that you're having. If you don't have one, let me know. Uh, Reach out and I'll be happy to go ahead and possibly be able to refer one to you through my affiliates program. So let's jump into what is going on in the nation. So gosh man there's so much stuff that's coming down the pike. All right first off National Labor Relations Board has put forth a ruling and those of you who have unionization in your work you're going to want to dig into this. There's a ruling that eases a way for employers to end union recognition. Um, I this is something if you've been listening to the show enough and if you listen to the other show that I've got which is a PR lady and HR lady walk into a bar podcast you'll know I don't talk about politics I, I'm I'm I start twitching and I'm vehemently against talking about politics for a reason there's too much of it out there right now I'm t- I want to focus in on what matters right so I'm also not here as a proponent for or against union work. Um, for several reasons, and I'll give you a little bit of a background. First off, my my grandfather, a lot of people don't know this, but my grandfather actually started some of the largest unions 
in Chicago back in it was the 50s and 60s and he started some big ones that were with Campbell Soup he started uh, Brock's Candy and a number of under other ones and those are just some some of the ones to give you an, an example and um, so I, I'm not against unions I'm I'm not especially not against them if they work and I've had clients with unions as well but there are employers out there that can benefit from ending a relationship or having union recognition and matter of fact my father was a hospital administrator for 23 years and he's one of the few hospitals that in fact did um, end union recognition with the nurses and he held to his word and that's very important that was very important to to the nursing staff uh, he made a commitment to them and he made sure that that commitment came through and when his commitments came through and demonstrated that the hospital really did have the best interest of the nursing staff at heart um, and that they were allowed to come to him and talk to him or his office or up the chain or whatever it was um, they actually decided to eliminate the union and try it and it has not been back ever since and he retired from the hospital in 1990 three nineteen ninety four so um, so ending union recognition isn't always necessarily bad but National Labor Relations Board does have a new ruling out there that makes that um, a little bit more easily attainable and it's something that if you do have a union and you are wanting to do kind of take the same path as what my dad did then you're gonna want to definitely take a look at it um, there's also a, a little IRS flash that came out and this is something that if you guys have employees that travel quite a bit you're going to want to take a look at what they're talking about non-compensatory business reasons surrounding whether an employee meal can or cannot be um, deemed as compensatory so definitely check that out it's well worth looking into uh, there are some new HRA rules that are coming out or have come out again you guys are going to want to take a look at that and if you don't know what an HRA is it's a health reimbursement account which is um, a little bit it's different than a an HSA which is a health savings account and health reimbursement account has some different rules to it and there could be some cost saving uh, factors and features to it so if you haven't looked into an HRA uh, or an HSA definitely check both of those out you can talk to your broker about them but an HRA there are some changes uh, that are either out or coming down the pike and you definitely are going to want to go ahead and take a look at that um, at the national level and the US House of Representatives has passed a $15 minimum wage bill so minimum wage has been one of those things where again patchwork law it's been kinda creeping up through the ranks so we're definitely going to keep our eyes open for that I usually don't talk a lot about what is in the House or what is in the Senate but this one is a big one and businesses are going to have to really start to evaluate um, you know compens compensability as far as what the minimum comp rate of compensability is for an organization especially if this continues to move through and we don't really exactly know fully what it looks like yet um, and I'm not going to dig too far into the content on it until it becomes a law if it becomes a law and when the date is and then we'll definitely get in it and talk a little bit more about it but now's the time to start looking and start evaluating if you're paying employees twelve to fourteen dollars or less an hour that you know are you prepared for a federal increase from you know whatever you're compensating them to a threshold of fifteen dollars an hour so I would definitely suggest looking at it the EEOC now we've talked about this several times and this is a kind of a continuation but the EEOC has released updated file specifications to the report the data the pay data reporting that is is due little in actually just a few months so um, if you are one of those companies that is required to actually put out this pay data report under EEO 1 when you file make sure that you are on top of understanding everything that happens now typically when it comes to first year um, there's a lot of chaos there's going to be mistakes eventually we'll wind up learning from other mistakes that were made as uh, you know interpretation but this is kind of one of those things where um, it was aim ready fire when it was put out and so 
Um, they've been really scrambling to try to get the right information out for employers to go ahead and do what they need to do to file. So there's a pretty good chunk of movement over in California, and I got a couple of couple of callouts to uh, to uh, the state over there. So currently, uh, there is a bill to exclude California employees from CCPA passes, and it's in the Senate. Okay, so. I should say, we should, let me say that again. There's a bill to exclude California employees from CCPA. That measure has passed in the Senate committee with additional changes. So that's something to keep your eyes on. Again, usually I don't really talk a lot about what's in motion, but this is definitely, again, one of those things that you're going to want to check into. We mentioned it last in the last episode, but uh, California has banned racial discrimination based on hairstyles through an act that is called the Crown Act. So if you're in California, have not caught in wind of that, you're going to want to check out the Crown Act. And then also, uh, California is moving forward with a bill to redefine independent contractor relationships. Now this, again, not all too familiar with it, but just understanding it from a very high level could conflict with what the independent contractor relationships are that is defined by the by the IRS. So, you know, more and more states are starting to make laws and changes on their books at the state level that are not necessarily in line with the federal level. And we got some more of those that are coming up here right now. Um, so Maine, and, and this one, this next one is not part of that last statement, but it is going to be pretty significant. Maine, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island either have made or are making changes to uh, different types of restrictions in regards to non-compete agreements. So if you are in those states and you have non-compete agreements, definitely check that out. New Jersey has also jumped on the bandwagon to amending medical marijuana laws that provides job protection and includes instructions around drug testing procedures and requirements around drug testing procedures. And that probably would also include limitations as well. So if you're in New Jersey, you're going to want to pay attention to that as well. Over in New York, New York has passed legislation allowing liens on employers for alleged wage claims. So if that short version sh means, and I don't know all the full details to it, um, is that if an employer has a claim against them of unpaid wages or wage, wage discrimination, or not wage discrimination, wage discrepancy, that a lien can be placed on the employer in, in order to get that um, uh, collected. So, And then New York also bans uh, salary history inquiries as part of the expansion of the pay equity law. Over in Oregon, uh, they have passed their family uh, medical leave law as well. And here's another one that is not in line with what is going on at the federal level. But if you remember a couple, the podcast or two ago, we t actually talked about how the Supreme Court ruled that obesity in and of itself is not protected under American with Disabilities Act. Well, Washington State disagrees with that. And um, the Washington Supreme Court has ruled that obesity actually does qualify as a disability. So <laughs> that right there um, is going to be kind of interesting to see how that, that plays out and how that pans out. So if you guys are in those states, you are going to want to, and you've heard me say it many times and I can't reemphasize it because you can tell I've been talking to clients about this. You guys are going to want to definitely pay attention to what's going on over there and uh, make sure that if you are in those areas and it sounds like you could be negatively impacted, you're going to want to definitely find ways strategically on how you can work to do what you need to do to stay compliant, but yet also figure out how to protect yourself. It's that delicate balance that happens between doing what's in the best interest of the employee and doing what's in the best interest of the company. And today we want to talk about recession proofing your your company and it's not exactly something that a lot of people would think that they would hear on a podcast surrounding human resources but you know what 
um, when recessions hit, companies are impacted across the board. Every division, every department, uh, you know, through operations to sales to service to everything. <laughs> it just goes everywhere, right? So we're definitely going to want to start taking a look at how is your how how recession proof is your organization and what is inevitably going to happen with your staff if and when the next in you know recession comes up because here's the thing the economists are predicting that there's going to be another recession and it's been in the works for a while and you know we we're in this really great state of growth economically speaking as a country and it's absolutely fantastic however what goes up must come down and that's just the natural, natural rule of life. You, you can't get around that. It's a natural law of, of the universe here. So there are some things that you guys can do, and we're going to talk about both on the business side and on the personnel side, um, to help really kind of start looking and assessing how your business is prepared for a recession. And there's some companies, believe it or not, that are out there that have a tendency to withstand uh, recessions better than other organizations and I want to give a couple of call outs so first off um, you know companies that focus in on candy cosmetics and believe it or not contraceptives have a tendency to withhold and ride the recession a little bit better than most companies oddly enough uh, retail uh, luxury retail tends to also uh, withstand you know different different impacts of the recession as well. Um, companies, uh, unfortunately, that focus in on repossession and removals, uh, they tend to thrive a little bit more. Uh, the federal government will withhold a certain level of um, tolerance to the a particular re recession. Education definitely do very well. Um, a lot of those things are funded by the state, unless it's a private organization different types of vices such as wine, cigar, tobacco, uh, anything that would be deemed as a vice. People we just kind of sometimes don't really want to let go of what our little comforts are and those tend to withstand a recession with uh, not really taking much of a beating. Any type of discount retail operation tends to do pretty good. Information technology will also continue to pursue and thrive and, and actually sustain and ride the wave pretty well because you know our advancements they just keep advancing <laughs> they don't really stop or hit a hold button or pause or anything like that um, healthcare especially since um, you know the greater I influx in the growing population of the boomers needing uh, a little bit more uh, to require that and any type of non-cyclical business and what I mean by that is a non-cyclical burst is something that it's kind of like a one-time thing. Um, this is a little bit morbid, but I'll explain it to you. Um, like funeral services, right? Funeral homes, those are a non-cyclical business. Because unfortunately, when somebody passes, we need them and they need to be there. So um, other industries that can fall under that non-cyclical uh, mantra are religious organizations, military, veteran, veterinarian services, repair technicians, pharmaceuticals. Matter of fact, the one thing that I noticed when we went through the last really big recession that took place in 2008 was the increase in pet stuff, which blew my mind because here we are listening to these major corporations dwindling down their workforce, you know, having to ask for bailouts, and people are buying and making more dog stuff and cat stuff than I ever saw. And I saw that when I, I worked for PetSmart, actually, for two years after I left CarMax. And, um, and CarMax had just gone through a reduction in force, and PetSmart was booming. And it was really interesting. I mean, we saw growth in different types of, you know, healthier alternatives of, of dog food and cat food. And um, I think Martha Stewart pushed out her line of pet care, Brett Michael's pushed out his line of prep care right all at the same time and we were in the middle of it and it was just absolutely amazing so there are some industries that will tolerate a recession actually quite well but if you're in an industry that has a tendency to feel the vulnerability of a recession there's some things that you can do really to start looking and talking now on how you can 
you know, ride that wave because it's it's going to come again. I don't know. I'm not confident that it's necessarily going to be as bad as the last one, which, um, you know, they refer to that one as the Great Recession. But, um, you know, we're definitely going to see some impact from it because, like I said, what goes up must come down. So and that helps uh, keep the world go round and round. All right. So one of the things that you can do is actually you can look for a specific customer need. So it, it, so again, remember I mentioned the dog stuff a little earlier, the pet care stuff? You know, that's a niche that proved to remain very, very strong and in demand through very difficult times. And what more than likely had happened is that in lieu of people spending money on vacations, spending money on holidays, spending money in ways that they were very comfortable doing so before, they just changed their buying habits. And so if you're able to identify a customer need in a particular niche that people are still going to want no matter what the economic situation will be in, then you're actually going to do yourself a huge favor. Um, make sure that you're going to, you're, that you're very willing to adapt. And um, it's a very strong trait a lot of companies really kind of have this unwillingness to change, but if you adapt to the different types of circumstances, then you're you're going to ride it pretty well. And one of the adaptations that companies will make is that they're going to evaluate their staffing levels, um, and they're going to want to know it's like, okay, so where do we need to start making modifications? How can we start moving work and work requirements to another individual, another department? another team. Those are going to be evaluated. In addition to that, the work in and of itself, because we have a tendency to sometimes make more work for ourselves um, because, you know, especially if you have the mindset of continuous improvement, right? When you're, when you're working on continuous improvement, which is a fantastic thing to do, and, and as always you should because you do need to con continue to evolve as a company. However, when you're working on continuous improvement, sometimes you can make change happen for the sake of change. And that is an ineffective use of company time, resources, and money. So that's why when people are looking at adaptation, they're not only looking at their people, but they're also looking at their processes too. Is this particular step really truly necessary? Do we have the ability to shave some time on it? Um, does it make sense to continue doing this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Um, certainly something that at the CEO and or CFO and the financial level um, is to take a look at finances and really understand, you know, the liquidity of the organization. Really understand, are you guys going to be able to pay your bills? And, you know, if you're, if you're starting to go down that route and you haven't shored up your situation and you're not 100% sure if, you know, what you have revenue-wise it's going to come in and that, you know, could be... A barrier to success then you know start talking to your bank start talking to your financial lenders start figuring out those plans now because when the recession hits is too late right so a recession you can look at it definitely in my business in my industry in HR I, I work in an environment where it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when and recessions are no different from that as well so you know you have to really understand um, what's going to happen as far as those challenges and finance really becomes a huge, you know, challenge during that downturn. Uh, you know, sales are going to automatically suffer unless you're in that niche that we talked about before. Um, you have to really evaluate if you're in a, you know, a business to consumer relationship, how that's going to be impacted. Have you diversified? Do you have a B2B relationship? you know, offering that you can put in a place to. So, you, you know, there's a lot of different avenues that you can take a look at and one, and, and particularly your, you know, your revenue sources. So when you're talking finances, you want to look at your revenue sources. Now you're probably sitting there saying, okay, so I thought this episode was about HR. I thought this is a whole HR series. Well, you know what? Business acumen is very much a part of human resources. And if you're in the HR seat and you don't understand how the money works, my recommendation is to definitely start figuring that out because money is, I hate to say, is what makes the world go round. It is what makes the ability for people to own a home, rent a home, 
be able to support their families, have you know those cute things that you have on your desk in front of you, be able to allow you to go and get a five and a half dollar cup of coffee, and really enjoy the things that sometimes we forget and we take for you know take for granted. So. Um, you know, really understanding the money aspect of this. And then, you know, HR too. It's like, well, human resources is not a revenue generating department. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's not. We suck up money. And matter of fact, in the company's, if you look at a company's P&L statement, um, we are the top two expenses in the whole organization, and that is payroll and benefits. And benefits could potentially be higher than payroll. All depends on what you guys offer. So, you know, you're going to want to diversify revenue resources, but you can also counter that as well as taking a look at alternate suppliers and vendors. And, you know, when you're looking at the HR side of things, you can start talking to your, your broker and start meeting with them that when it comes time for renewal time, have them bring in your benefit um, representative to sit down and say, what can we do to continue to offer a good benefits program? but yet start trimming cost because cost is going to always be there. So, you know, it's a way of not committing to different types of higher level of expenses. And, you know, shopping ahead of time and locking those things down are going to be very important. Uh, another thing that you can do, and this is, this is actually a really critical one, is making sure that you guys are making good hiring decisions. Um, sometimes, you know, when things are going great in business, we want to expand. You know, it, you know, we've got, you know, from the last recession, we had a lot of people taking on extra work with no additional compensation. So it was extra responsibility, doing a lot more for the same amount, if not for less. And those really juicy, high paying jobs just weren't in there. So, when the when we felt the ease of that pressure one of the first things is we want to do is we want to kind of want to reset and have some things go back to normal which means that somebody who's absorbed all that extra work may not want you know be a good idea to transfer that back over to somebody else well here's the thing when when the economy is growing well and you're expanding your workforce you want to definitely expand it on a well thought out plan and something that is strategic, not knee-jerk reaction, not, oh my gosh, I wish I could, you know, take this off of my plate. You're good. That would be great. But you want to definitely take a look at what makes sense financially. And again, that's where that business acumen starts coming into place. Um, you are going to want to really have a really good understanding of how human resources and the things that HR is capable of doing in a positive way isn't going to be a disruptor in the business and isn't going to be a factor into having to trim some fat. Um, it's just something that you're going to have to look into because layoffs are expensive. <laughs> layoffs and reductions in force are expensive. If your company is a company that you are looking at reducing your workforce and starting to identify those particular individuals where if you were in a position financially where you're not able to necessarily do that, then, you know, you're going to have to make some pretty hard decisions. And if you're offering, if you're offering the ability to take a severance package or an early retirement, you know, those are things that you're going to have to evaluate. What the, is it cost effective to do something like that and how much of it can you offer? So, you know, that all comes down to really taking a look and taking care of your cash flow. And that's going to be, we've mentioned finances before, but that's going to be very significant. Um, you know, those pesky expenses are constant. <laughs> they, they don't let up. And God knows I wish they would every now and again. Can you just give us a month free? And that would be great. One whole month of not having to pay a bill would be just fantastic, wouldn't it? But unfortunately, that is not reality. So, um, you know, you're going to have to take care of your cash flow as a company because cash flow impacts everything. And a number one, a company's number one responsibility is not profit. It's not making money. A number one responsibility for any company in the U.S. or anywhere in the world is to keep their the ability to keep their doors open and make payroll month after month, every two weeks, week after week, whatever it is that you pay out. 
that is the responsibility of the organization and you are going to have some of those clients that are very consistent or periodically make those late payments um, they're very overdue and that impacts your cash flow right that's just one example of how your cash flow gets impacted so um, you know certainly take a look at those things other things that you can do too just kind of thinking through it you know take a look at your inventory management processes so if you are a widget based company take a look at how you guys are managing inventory um, you know if you have to put a matter of fact I was talking to somebody the other day where their accountant um, decided to go ahead and take advantage of a really good deal and order some apparel they ordered about a thousand units um, of apparel but in the real fact in reality is is that from experience um, of a partner in the company that only 30 percent is going to sell within the first six weeks after that apparel in this particular industry tends to drop because it's no longer deemed as special if that makes sense so they're going to have an influx of inventory and eventually what's going to happen is that they're going to have to mark it down and discount it out the door to the point where it may be just below cost and then they won't even be able to give it away um, so that really great deal may not have necessarily turned out to be the best deal at all and in fact um, after listening to what they said and having my own experience and doing exactly the same thing for a nonprofit organization I had I had to wholeheartedly agree uh, because I even purchased a small quantity at a higher price but the great part is is that when we market this particular apparel for this nonprofit we still get hundred percent capture back so um, you know, you're going to have to think very clearly and, and strategically about your inventory because you can make a huge difference. You don't want to have a lot of inventory that's not selling because that is, that's the liability that sits on your books. And I'm not talking about risk and liability. I'm talking about liability in terms of accounting. Um, other things that you can do is, you know, make sure you're capitalizing on current customers. You know, if you guys are offering a service-based platform and you have a customer that's not taking full advantage of it where they have opportunity to do so and I'm not talking about they don't have a need for something right away like for instance when I worked for um, ADP you know I worked for a full service platform but you know not everybody was hiring and so they didn't necessarily need to use the hiring uh, services that were provided but we wanted to make sure that they were fully utilizing the service you know based off of their business needs so definitely make sure that you take time to understand your current customers and are they taking full advantage of the services that they are, are signing up for and if they're not you know that's an opportunity to capture some more revenue especially if you do it in a way where they're not feeling harassed because I'm gonna tell you right now when customers all of a sudden hear from you and they don't hear from you for a long time they know that you guys as an organization are hurting for money so having that continuous relationship is going to be extremely extremely important um, another thing that you can do too is every company has core competencies right every company is really great at something or multiple things and if you really fully master those gifts then you're going to do exceptionally well and I'm going to give you an example of what I saw when I worked at CarMax before CarMax grew into the size that they were today or that they are today we were really great at our processes and I'm not saying that the, we, we weren't really great now or aren't really great now that's not what I'm saying but we just man we just had them down and I remember watching how good the team was that I worked with and how impressed I was at how we were able to you know make our goals and, and actually we were blowing them out of the water month after month but we were good at what we did and when we were good at what we were did we were able to meet the expectations of the customer and a lot of times we were able to exceed them because when you're good at what you do you tend to be faster and more effective and efficient at it and if that's the case now you're in a situation to where that customer service is really going to start to shine which is something else that you can do too is that you can also make sure that you are looking at your customer service you know what's going on with the customer service team what's going on with customer service values in your organization 
that just popped into my head. You know, when you have a strong customer service based organization where that is a cultural standard, it's a cultural norm, it's a cultural expectation, you're going to, you are really going to just blow your competitors out of the water. And I'll give you an example of one organization that really excels at this, and it is Uber. Uber's driver on the driver side, not the rider side, but the Uber driver side, when any driver that needs help, and I've sat and listened to these folks on the phone, I have a very good friend of mine who's a, an Uber driver, and I have sat and listened to questions that were being asked, and the level of respect and quality customer service that is delivered to an Uber driver is unparalleled to anything that I've seen literally since I worked at my grandfather's hardware store. It is absolutely fantastic. So if you're listening to this and you want to understand what quality customer service is like, <laughs> see, do your research on Uber driver, on the, on the driver side, because it is phenomenal. Um, these individuals, they listen to what is being said. They actually repeat the concern uh, that is presented. They politely ask to put somebody on hold. They really handle things at a very professional level. You don't get anybody who will just give you a half of an answer or will tell you that this is this is what you need to do, but they don't take the time to help you understand exactly how to do it. So when you have those extra steps and you make sure that that phone call is the most important phone call or email or whatever it is that they're working on at that particular moment, you're going to have you're going to build customer loyalty that is unparalleled and it will, your competition will not be able to surpass that. So focus in on customer service because it's going to be actually, actually huge. Make sure, look, don't stop marketing your business either, right? That's going to be another important aspect of how you recession proof your business. Make sure that your marketing message continues to get out there. Make sure that your marketing message as a employer of choice is also continuing to get out there because that makes a difference. You know, people know in tense times when things are tense, but when you guys still focus in that this is a great place to work, look, we are, fa you know, we're facing an uphill battle just like the rest of the country is, just like the other people in our industry, but, you know, we're still here, we're still strong. You know, we're still bringing in people. We're still able to offer the things that we can offer to you as an employee. We're not going anywhere, right? Those types of, that type of messaging really tends to do a lot for your employee morale, and it really does tend to keep things moving forward. Um, other things that you can do, too, is, you know, don't be afraid to do kind of a Q&A session with your employees as well. Right, it's something that will help because when people are feeling the burn of a recession or they're feeling the burn of a problem, a lot of the times people want to raise their hand and they want to get out and help, right? So why not use the imagination of an employee? Why not use the initiative of an employee to help things go forward? Got some other little kind of quick things um, that came up um, during my research that I just want to throw out to you. You know what? Develop short-term business goals, 30-day goals, things that are attainable, things that can be hit. Look at how you are cutting your expenses, and I'm going to give you an like a paradigm shift. In lieu of cutting expenses, open up the doors to an initiative to identify how a company can cut waste and wasteful spending in the organization. That's going to be really different than cutting costs, and you're going to be amazed at what employees come up with, right? If you say, we're going to launch this initiative on how we can reduce waste in the company, you will be amazed at what people come up with. It'll be from everything from, you know, turning the lights off at a specific time to ordering less paper to, you know, it's just things that they will pull out and you're like, I, you know, wow, and it makes so much sense. And when you run the numbers on it, you do the analysis on it, you're going to find that there's an opportunity. And when people are telling you this, they buy into it and they will help it make it happen. So definitely sit on top of that because that is a phenomenal advantage to take it, to really capitalize on. Um, so we talked about, you know, customer service. Um, here's another one. 
under promise and over deliver. I wanted to get back to this customer service thing again because that's going to be really important. Um, and I wanted to mention that earlier, so I'm slipping it in now. Also, lastly, um, this is something that you guys are going to want to sit on. You know what? Change, change how you guys go after your invoices. And this is, again, about protecting your cash flow. And a lot of companies don't necessarily do this, but some organizations, you know, if their invoices are at like net 30 um, or net 45, you know what? Start going after those invoices on day 31 and day 46. And it'll do a couple things. Number one, it's going to keep people employed because you need your in house team to work at getting a hold of that money. It's also going to decrease some of your ratios when you've got an organization that's going to be looking at um, your ability to pay your invoices. And again, it's that's managing that cash flow thing. So, number one, you're going to feel it on the inside. Number two, you're going to see it with your employees because the sooner they can get their hands on that money, the less likely you're going to have to actually start reducing your workforce and pushing some people out the door. And number three, your investors, your shareholders, your stockholders, banking finances or financial institutions, they're going to also see your effectiveness in managing your cash and cash is king. So those are some things that you guys can do to really take advantage of how to recession proof your company. Now, a lot of people will tell you that I am risk adverse. I'm, I'm not risk adverse. I'm here to talk about risk so that way it's a constant seed that you plant in your mind and balance it out with all the other good things that needs to happen too. Looking at your company from a in a consistent way to identify where your pitfalls are money wise and what would happen if there's a, a shift in business is key and critical. It is a responsibility of the organization. Even myself, when I look at my own business practices, I'm in the process of actually developing some stuff and I'm going to talk to you about it in a little while that is going to expand my business online in the virtual industry. Well, here's a question for you. How sustainable do you think my business is going to be if the lights go out? What happens if we actually have a power grid failure? What happens if there's a natural disaster of which the server where my my stuff is you know held on and distributed to my clients and people who are participating including this podcast what happens if those things go away well so does the money <laughs> so even they may be down for a short period of time it makes a significant impact to your business so it may not be the recession it could be just the natural ebb and flow of business but when you pay very close attention to these things that we've talked about today you're going to be way ahead of everybody else who goes to a holy crap now we're in a really bad situation and now we have to scramble to get things done your morale drops your customers see what's going on and it's and it's stressful my gosh it just pours the stress on over your head so take some time take a look at where your opportunities are within the organization where your threats are do a SWOT analysis you know really start getting ahead of what may or may not be coming down in the next 12 to 18 months. So for those of you who have been listening in, you guys know that I'm very interested in hearing what you all have to say. I want to know what's on your mind. And so I'm opening up the opportunity every episode to give you a way to go ahead and email me your HR questions. You can submit your question on the bestpractices.org website by clicking on the podcast link from the menu down towards the bottom of the podcast page. You'll see a submission form for you to go ahead and actually post your question, which I may read aloud and answer on an upcoming episode. And today's question is a little bit different than normal. Um, typically don't take questions in relation to the employee's side, but I thought this was a good one to share. This actually came from an employee who's dealing with some difficulty. A couple podcast episodes ago, I put out there, you know, what kind of questions are employees asking? Well, this one was a good one. And I wanted to kind of walk through what happens in a situation like this. So the question is this. My employer bounced a paycheck. How should I handle it? You know, 
I mentioned earlier in our podcast today that, you know, the number one responsibility that any business has is to keep its door open to make payroll <clears throat> time and time again. And when that doesn't happen, questions like this start coming up because issues like this start coming up. So when an employee has a situation where an employer has bounced a paycheck, there's a lot of legal ramifications that kick in. However, there is actually a safe harbor provision or a safe harbor period. And what that means is, is that if the employer is doing what, the, what they can to correct the situation within a reasonable period of time, um, then you know what, employers typically aren't going to have problems. But the fact that an employer is bouncing a paycheck is a significant issue. Now, you know what, there are times where, look, things get goofy, right? EFTs don't go through, elective funding transfers, you know, stuff happens. And that is going to be the exception and not the rule. But if you're in a situation where paychecks are bouncing more than once in the lifetime of the company, then that is problematic and you guys are going to really have to get a hold on your cash flow really quickly. So what to do if an employee comes up and says, um, my paycheck has bounced? First thing you want to do is reassure the employee that you're going to take care of it, you're going to look into it. Now, what some people will do is run out to the bank and actually go get cash. You don't want to do that. You want to be very, very careful about what you're doing, mainly because you want to make sure that you are clearly documenting every step of what's going on. You want to make sure that if you're using a, a professional payroll service, that you don't interrupt the process by going and getting cash or writing a check out of the checkbook to resolve the issue. The first thing you want to do, and yes, I understand it's going to get tense because the employee wants their money. Totally understand that. But the very first thing that you want to do is you want to work in partnership with that payroll provider to find out what needs to be done. That's the very first thing. You're going to want to go ahead and research that. The other thing you're going to want is make sure that you collect that documentation from the employee to verify, in fact, that the check has actually bounced. And how you do that is through their uh, have getting a copy of their bank notification statement. Not their bank statement, but the notification of NSF or non-sufficient fund statement that they had actually received. Now sometimes those things will show up before the statement actually is in the hands because the NFS can now be seen online with the convenience of the internet. Um, so you definitely want to confirm and verify that the check is actually bounced. Now, if you're working with a payroll provider, it is very likely that the situation can be resolved within about 24 hours, especially if you can confirm and verify that the funds are in place. The payroll company can just simply go ahead and reprocess the payment and the direct deposit should go through or reissue another check that can be cut because likelihood the bank's not going to accept the original one and have it overnighted. So there are some things in place that you can do to resolve the situation. Now, if you're not working with a payroll provider, and let's say, example, you're running payroll yourself within your own organization, then same thing applies. You're going to want to confirm that the, the employee actually did have a return check for NSF and go ahead and reprocess the payroll or at least that individual's check through the payroll system once you have confirmed and verified that the money is available in your account. And if you don't know what to do or how to do that, you know, those systems actually have, you know, call centers that you can call into and ask for support and for some help. But it's very important that you continue to process through whatever system that you're doing it because you have to keep track of that documentation and, doc and that paperwork. You don't want to be in a situation where you're issuing somebody a cash or writing a check right out of the checkbook because that is not a viable record of payroll. And if you don't have that, next thing you know it, you can have a disgruntled employee turn around and start making claims that you're not paying them. And like what we heard earlier <clears throat> in one of the states, that they can actually put a lien on missing wages. So bad, 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 right? Don't want to do that. Uh, another question that came across uh, my desk today is, how can I get a copy of your new book? Well, I've got two books that are out. And the first book is called, Holy Cow, I Have to Fill Out a 99. And the second book that is out is, Holy Cow, I Have to Talk to My Boss. You can find both of those books actually out on uh, bestpractices.work on the website over there. You can find them on amazon.com. It's a little easier to go to bestpractices.work 
because to look it up in Amazon.com, you have to spell my last name correctly, which not a lot of people do. <laughs> they barely even know how to say it. So um, if you want to visit bestpractices.org, you can go ahead and order your copy and get it sent out to you. That is not a problem. And if you do, I certainly appreciate it. Um, we've got some really cool things coming down the pike that I am extremely excited about. Um, I've been in the process of developing and testing online courses and workshops. And matter of fact, this week I've got, what, two, two workshops this week and I've got a three-day workshop next week uh, that's specifically local here in the Virginia Beach area. But I'm going to be releasing the first online course on August 1st. And you'll be able to find that information on bestpractices.org. And the course is going to be Understanding American with Disabilities Act for Employers. So keep an eye out for that. There's going to be more information coming down for that. In addition to that, starting in September of this year, um, I'm going to be hosting every month uh, workshops locally. But I'm also going to turn one of them into a visual, into a virtual uh, workshop as well. So that schedule will actually be posted up on the website effective August 1st as well. And you could probably find that, I think, under the events page, if I remember correctly and what I talked to my uh, web designer on. So very super excited about that stuff. Um, when I release an online course, you guys are going to know about it. But I'm also going to give you a incentive to jump in and then we're going to give you a significantly reduced price for the first two weeks of any new course that comes out so that stay tuned for that that's going to be pretty cool but i really appreciate you guys uh you know joining us again today on the on the podcast episode this is this is just a lot of fun and if you want to find out more about what's going on and and all the other great stuff that's being put out there you can follow me in several different places you can follow me on instagram and facebook at best practices in hr on Twitter, LinkedIn, and now YouTube, you can find me at Brenda Neckvattle. It's B-R-E-N-D-A-N-E-C-K-V-A-T-A-L. That's N-E-C-K, like the thing you want to choke. V is in Victor, A-T-A-L. And again, the website is bestpractices.org. So jump on the mailing list. You'll be up to date on what's going on. If you miss something on the mailing list or you just really don't want to fill up your inbox, totally understand. You can follow me on any of those sites and uh, you'll be kept up to date with all the cool things that are coming down. So thank you again for your questions today. It was really awesome. Keep them coming. And I'm super, super excited uh, that you guys have joined me and stay tuned for the next upcoming podcast. Have a good one, guys. Take care. Bye.